Hello, and welcome back to the video lecture series for Introduction to the Art of Programming using Scala. This video begins our discussion of networking, and we're going to start off talking about TCP sockets. So TCP stands for the Transmission Control Protocol, uh, and it's one way for computers to talk to one another. There's also a UDP, the Uniform Datagram Protocol, uh, which is used uh, for certain specific applications. We're going to focus on TCP um, part. It, it is the primary uh, way in which communication is, is done on computers, and it's a lot easier to work with, which is inevitably part of why it's the primary way that things are done. Um, now, of course, networking is just having computers talk to one another, and it's something that is absolutely essential for, for most of the computing that you do these days. Uh, because you, for example, you'll have devices that become useless if they aren't attached to, to a network. Um, so it'll be good for us to see how we can make our programs do networking and, and have, have it so that a program running on one computer can talk to a, a program running on another. So in order to do this, we are going to use uh, code from the, or the libraries in java.net. So the java.net package, as the name implies, has different classes uh, inside of it for doing networking. And for TCP, we're going to focus in particular on two of these, the server socket and the socket. Okay, so when you do your network program, you are going to have, there are two computers at least involved, and there are two programs involved here. And one of them acts as the server. This is the program that is waiting and accepting connections from other machines. Uh, and then the other, or one or more others, will be acting as clients, and they will make connections over to the server that's, uh, over to the machine that's acting as a server. So on the program and the machine that's acting as a server, we need to create a server socket. When we do this, we will give it a port number, now, the book has a, a detailed description of port numbers. You can also find information on them on the web. Uh, lowered number port, port numbers, things in the, uh, the first thousand, are reserved, and so you should not try to use those port numbers. I'll typically pick something in the 4,000 to 6,000 range uh, when, I'm, when I'm writing code. Um, and they can go up to, to the values that are... Uh, on the order of a, of a short int. So uh, there are lots of different ports you could use. Only one program can have a port open at a given time. So if you run two instances of the same program and they both use server sockets, if you haven't written code to make it so the second instance uses a different port, it won't work. Uh, so we start off, we'll create a server socket. We'll tell it what port we want to communicate on. And then the primary call that we're going to use from our server socket is accept. Now accept is a blocking call, uh, which means that when we call accept, the program sits there and twiddles its thumbs until some other program comes in and makes a connection. Once that other program makes a connection, accept returns to us a socket. And so that was the other type that we want to talk, to, talk about. <laughs> Turns out if you're on the client side, all you do is make a regular socket to start with, and there are a number of different ways of constructing them. The approach that we will use is to pass it a string and a port number. So both the client and the server have to agree on what port they're going to, to talk through. And you give the name of the machine you want to connect to as the host. Okay, so on the client side, we'll make a socket in this way. Once that connects on the server side, the server socket gives you back a regular socket, which will have the connection. And so then we have two pieces that can talk to each other. So instead of keeping this in the abstract, how about we go ahead and make a little example um, So we'll make a simple network example. Now, I'm only going to write the server in this example. Uh, we'll see later how we could, could write a, a client as well, and I guess I, I could write a client. But I'm going to start off just writing the server side of this. So inside of our main, 
we're going to make a valve for our server socket and I will go with port 4444 here. We have to import our server socket and as we said we make a call to the server sockets except and this is a blocking call so the program just sits here and waits until something makes a connection and once it's made a connection it gives us back the socket which has the ability to connect to the client okay so simple enough code here the fact that this is blocking is significant um, in fact in this chapter on networking we include topics from the previous two chapters because they're essential uh, if you, you know when it comes to ordering of material before you can talk about networking, it turns out we have to talk about both multi-threading because we have problems that this is a blocking call and we might need to be able to do we might need to do other things at the same time, so we're going to wind up spawning threads when we do this. At the same time, uh, it turns out that what we're going to see next is that in order to talk through sockets, we need to use streams. Okay, so so I have a socket. And now I want to maybe send something through that socket and read something from the socket. I want to start doing communication. Well, what can we do with our socket? We looked at how to construct it. There are a whole bunch of calls on our sockets. And by the way, one of these is close. And you should close sockets, just like you should close files. Because a program is only allowed to have a certain number of sockets open. So when you're done with a socket, make sure that you, uh, that you close it. For the communication aspect of it, we're going to use the methods get input stream and get output stream. Uh, you know, should sound familiar as our last chapter was on input streams and output streams and how we do communications through streams. And what is the, what is the get input stream return? It returns a Java.io dot input stream. Okay, the exact same thing that we're talking about previously. In the last chapter, the only type of input stream that we actually used at the bottom level to actually like attach to data was a file input stream. Okay? And then we wrapped that inside of like a buffered input stream or an object input stream or whatnot. Here we're seeing that instead of using a file input stream, we can actually get an input stream from, from a socket. And this is one of the cool things about the way that decoration works on streams is if you write code and instead of making it so it specifically takes a file input stream, you make it to, so it takes a general input stream, you can use that same code with files or to send stuff across the network. Uh, so that's, that's one of the, the powerful and flexible aspects of how the Java libraries were designed here. So I want to get an input stream and I want to get the output stream. And we'll get them from our socket. So input stream equals uh, networking communication, just like uh, file communication, is slow. And so it's one of these things that you probably want to buffer. Um, so I'll have a buffered input stream. No, not new input stream, sorry. Sock dot get input stream. And let's import that. And let's actually go with a print stream wrapped around a buffered output stream. Oops. I need a new wrapped around sock dot get output stream and see if I have uh, typed everything right. Okay, that seems fine. And the first thing I'm going to do here is I will say os dot print line. And uh, then I want to read something from the other side. Now, this is where, okay, so, so our IS is an input stream. In this case, it's specifically a buffered input stream. And remember, that just gives you the ability to, uh, to read you know, bytes off of something. 
There's also the fact that the person on the other side might not have typed anything, and I really need to pause and wait for them to do that. For now, I'm going to do that as a, as a busy wait. I'm going to say while, while I have no input, and I can check that by doing while is.available is less than 1. I'll go ahead and put curlies. Just wait. Okay, Do nothing. Sit there and do a busy wait. Um, if we wanted this to not take up quite as much computing resource, we could actually put a thread.sleep in here. And maybe sleep for 100 milliseconds. So it will only check 10 times per second, uh, which is still more than fast enough for human interactions. Uh, we could take that down a little bit so it goes a little bit faster. Uh, but it's, it, humans won't notice a delay there, but it will actually improve or make this so it's not just sitting there going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You can slow down how fast it asks. Once we have that, then I'm going to make a buffer that is an array of bytes. And it is going to have a size of is.available. And then I want to read that. and print it out onto our screen. Okay. Um, actually, let's... And then let's respond with the same... Uh, let's tell them back what they said to us. Okay. Code compiles. Yay. Um, so if I run this, it's running. It sits there and it says it's running. I didn't write a client side though. Okay. Well, it turns out that in the case of if you're doing simple text input uh, on your server, you can you can use the program Telnet to do your communication. So you don't actually have to write a client. In fact, so one of the projects in the book that starts that, that started a while ago was is this MUD, a text adventure, and it's supposed to be a multiplayer text environment where you have multiple uh, multiple players that are inputting commands and, and running around in a world. And ideally they would all be able to connect using Telnet. Now, here I'm using localhost. I'm running this on my one computer here. If this were on another machine, uh, it would work just it would work it well as long as you don't have any firewalls in between that prevent you from from making Telnet connections. Uh, so, we have a connection here. And it said, I typed in this is a test. You'll see this is a test came over here. But note that on this side, none of the things that I typed appeared. Okay, so I had over here, I was supposed to write hi there, and I was supposed to write back the input. But those didn't print out. In fact, nothing printed out. The only thing that I see is, is what I typed. So what's going on there? Well. One of the commands for an output stream, uh, and we talked about this for, for files, is that, especially because I am buffering this, remember, it keeps things inside of that buffer until you fill the buffer. And that's great for performance if you're writing a lot of stuff, but if you want something to be forcefully sent or to, to clear out the buffer and actually go across, you need to flush it. Okay, and once again, this matters for files uh, because you, you'll have situations where you want to make sure that something goes out to a file at a certain time. Uh, it also matters for networking. So if we run this again, and then we come and we do our telnet, now you'll see it automatically said, hi there, enter my name, 
and it gives me back that input. And there you go. Okay, so this is our very first simple uh, little example of doing networking. We'll come back in the next video and I will elaborate on this, make it so that it's actually kind of a, a chat room. Uh, we can have a, we can make it so that it will talk through Telnet. We could also write a little client. Maybe we'll take a, a second video to, to write a client um, and expand this out so there can be multiple people that are all connecting to this one program and talking.